Hey, Phil. Hello, David. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Um, hopefully, we've got a, a, a few people uh, joining us this morning. Uh, we might give you um, 30 seconds to kind of get yourself a last minute cup of tea and, and get ready to go. Um, I have mine here in my Liverpool cup. Um, well, it is, so, well, it is a fireside chat. You know, you gotta have your you gotta have your cup of tea. Exactly right. Um, and we'll kick off, and we'll talk a little bit about reinventing loyalty. That would be good because I think between us, we've um, we've pretty much did did that for the airline industry. Yeah, we have we have circled the sun uh, a, a couple of times. Um, and uh, so, speaking of that, let's let's just get get off with, with introductions. Um, I'll start with myself. Uh, I'm Dave Canty. Um, I am a partner of New World Loyalty in the US, um, formerly Vice President of Global Loyalty for IHG. And before that, I was with JetBlue for eight years in New York. And of course, I also spent 11 years of my life in uh, with, with Starwood, uh, or in its previous uh, capacity, ITT Sheraton. So I've been in Loyalty for the best part of 25 plus years. Um, I've seen reinventions. Um, I've been part of reinventions. Um, so hopefully the conversation we have today um, uh, is enlightening in some way. So Phil, tell us about it. Okay, so I'm Phil Gunter. I'm also New World Loyalty, based down in uh, Australia. And I'm probably best known for uh, running Virgin's Velocity program for seven years, which I think is, well, is now recognized as, um, as a program which did start or, or reinvented loyalty for airlines in, in, with the revenue accrual, etc. Uh, before that, I was in banking for a while and did many things, including run rewards for American Express a long time ago. So, wow. um, yeah, no, I've, so I've seen um, rewards from both sides, airlines, financial services, but and in your loyalty, we've looked after clients in every industry. So we've, we've, see, we've seen it through so many lenses now and always looking to... Um, for for that reinvention always looking for something new well i mean the principles essentially are the same is, would that be fair oh so it's fair that the principles are the same but one thing i, I always do is, is i always start i always go right back to first principles i, I i'm always nervous about about some assuming i know more than i do and i always go right back what are you trying to achieve what's the customers think see do and what's the numbers um and that and that little that little pyramid it's, it's always set me well. You know, that's that's uh, it's really reassuring to to hear one of the the um, the leaders, um, you, you know, and the the guy who basically started it all in in some ways for for uh, the airline uh, space with with velocity. It's really reassuring to hear that you get nervous when you kind of approach a new program, because I get nervous um, all the time and. I think it's a healthy kind of um, safety net in some ways that we kind of check ourselves to make sure that our approaches are correct or at least uh, stand up to, to, to scrutiny. Um, sure. But at the same time, the same time um, I do think it's important that, you know, we allow creativity to come out. And I, what, I, what, what I find kind of reassuring as well is there is an interest in from others, certainly within organizations I've worked in, there's an interest to get involved in loyalty, learn about it, and kind of understand how it can influence their future careers. There, well, funny enough, that's one of the challenges of the industry. Because uh, I think you were saying that before, David, that um, everyone thinks they're an expert in loyalty. Um, the word itself cr creates all sorts of, um, of misunderstandings in people's minds. Uh, and one of the challenges, often internal challenges, is battling with, with, with people who believe they, they've got the answers, where they might not work for the customer, or they might not work economically, and they might not work for the business. Yeah. So let's, let's start um, with, with your, your journey into velocity, um, because even though we want to talk about where loyalty is going, possibly tomorrow yeah i think it would be great to kind of um start off by listening to your thought process when you first joined velocity 
um, and how you kind of approached the, the re-engineering of that and the reimagining of, of loyalty in that space. Okay. Well, first, I do want to I do want to give a call out to a guy called David Lloyd, right? Because David Lloyd was a guy that first designed. Because I joined Velocity three months in. Right? David Lloyd designed the trust. So the, the 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 core foundation of Velocity is built on this customer trust, and uh, it was a it was an absolute genius stroke at the time. No one understood it, um, and yet right now I don't know if you followed it, but. Um, um, Virgin Australia is now in administration and um, there's a lot of noise in, in the market around are people going to lose their points and, that, and after all these years out of nowhere comes the trust which basically says the points are safe um, and that structure that that foundation of, of, of building a program from the beginning based on um, some really good customer principles some good economic principles and good customer principles was brilliant um, the, a good backbone does does you well but you don't necessarily see know it's there because you only you only see it in the in in the darkest days when it does its yeah. job um but having said that um so i joined three months in um uh the, they had launched a program very quickly typical virgin they've done it really quickly they, they built this trust which was fantastic and the rest of it was pretty much rubbish so um there was they had no air rewards they had no tears um it was essentially a marketing program with a great big was launched with a massive um tv campaign saying we we reward you faster and there was no way of rewarding people faster so so i joined <laughs> so i joined, so it, so they did reinvent uh the, the 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 i guess the um the 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 structure model um they did a really good job of that but they, they they missed some of the other stuff i joined and had a big problem because the program was losing a million dollars a month um customers didn't get it uh, the marketing didn't align to what it was and and i had literally a big problem on my hand because i had to really quickly work out a what was possible what did the customer expect and what what could what was at the time um close to a low-cost carrier sustain um and it was a little bit chaotic at the beginning but we the, a lot of the foundations of velocity was built in that first few months where we 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 went in i basically i, I looked i asked customers i asked so many customers I had lots and lots and lots of um standing behind screens having lunches all sorts of customers to find out what was it that they wanted from a loyalty program Right, so what we didn't do, right? So, so right, what I did not do, I didn't look at Qantas. Right, I knew that we couldn't compete with Qantas. They were way, way too, too, too um, big, powerful. Um, so I didn't go to Qantas. I didn't go to the competitor. I went to the customer and said, "What do you want?" And and also, what what annoys you? What 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 really pisses you off about other programs, whether it be Qantas or someone else? Um, and we we basically went back there looked at the numbers and built up a new commercial model between the airline and the program um which still exists today where we we were we were able to deliver the, the number one thing was they wanted access to reward seats simple as that yeah so it, i'll be honest with you it's, it's as much perception as, as um anything else but they that was their thing so we built the world's best reward seats it but we had any seat we had classic rewards and we had any seat on any airline in the world which was a brilliant tagline and it was basically um only ever used once um but but we we went we, we built up velocity to solve their biggest problem but we did it with an economic model which meant that it, it, everything that the velocity did went made a little bit of money and it was it was as yeah. simple as that but the it, a part of that was a revenue um a revenue Earn per dollar, not per mile, um, and part of it was the the sort of multiple um, airline rewards and also so obviously some of the partners and stuff. But but what was interesting, um, so we relaunched it um, a few months after with tiering, with airline rewards, with with some more partners, etc. Um, and I then went um, on around the world, basically seeing whatever else thought and. The consensus, it was it was pretty much everyone. I, I, I can't remember talking to you at the time, David, but um, 
in 2008, uh, the consensus was that we were absolutely berserk. Mm -hmm. And this thing was ridiculous and no one was going to like it. And you've got to, and, and some of the, the old crusties, as I called them at the time, I was much younger. I'm now crusty. Um, <laughs> we are crusties now. We're crusties, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but some of the old, many of the old crusties were really, really quite harsh on me, saying that I would never fly an airline if they didn't give one point per mile in all seats down the back. Um, and I remember having a fight with about 400 people in a room in Istanbul when I was saying, you're all wrong, right? You're yeah. all wrong, right? You're all going to follow me. Um, you just don't know it yet. Right? Yeah. And I remember walking out of that room thinking, like, I'm sure I'm right. right? I'm sure I'm right, right? But I couldn't work out how no one else could see it at the time. And it's all to do with um, some of the accounting rules, which I knew were going to change. Um, yeah. And what transpired after that, um, for about a year later, nothing had happened. And I began to, I went to another conference to start to think I was a bit of an idiot. But um, then JetBlue, thank you, David, you guys followed and people started to take it seriously. And then the whole thing slowly, slowly, slowly started to happen. And then yeah. the last few years, everyone's gone that way. And what, what was interesting um, about JetBlue um, at the time, so to give you a, a, some level of context as to how that kind of came about, was when I when I joined JetBlue in the uh, in January of 2007, um, I was brought in with a, with a purpose to reinvent loyalty for for the the program for for the airline, and I was actually taking my inspiration from my time at Starwood. So I was actually taking the SPG model in many ways because it was points per dollar spent and so forth, and I kind of thought, is there a way to take that into the airline industry? And little did I know, because I was, it was going to be my first airline, that you were, you were actually already doing that out in Australia. Um, but the interesting thing for me was I actually got the same kind of a reaction in the United States about, this guy's a nutcase, He's, this is never going to work. Um, in fact, I remember sitting in, in, in a conference in New York um, in our hometown, in JetBlue's hometown, when all the leaders of loyalty uh, from all the majors were actually sharing the same stage and discussing um, revenue-based programs and saying they would never work. And I was kind of sitting in the audience with everybody kind of looking at me and saying, wow, that's a big risk to take. But you know what? You also mentioned the fact that um, you didn't look at Qantas, but you did actually go out and speak to members and customers and ask them what are the things that they hate or in, yeah. to use your own words what are the things that piss you off and we did ex actually exactly the same we utilized the customer base to hear about what are the things that frustrate them most about airline programs and um, then we started planting some some ideas out there and I remember the, the leadership at JetBlue at the time, while being supportive, they were also conscious of the fact that um, some conversation might be happening on you know, social media and blogs and whatever that may kind of get us into a situation that we are not able to control. But we actually, we actually saw that as an opportunity in the end because what we started to do was we started to publish surveys to what was supposed to be a closed user group of, of members and that got published on flyer talk yeah. and i remember what the hell are we going to do and my intent was not to build a program for flyer talkers that no. i was actually going to try and build the antithesis of uh, yeah. what they wanted um and we kind of floated some of the ideas out there and then actually watched the conversation happen in real time. Uh, it get debated. Um, so I thought it was really interesting. Um, but it also allowed us to ensure that we were being genuine and authentic to our own membership base because we were basically saying we were shaping the program based on their feedback. And I think it's lived, it's lived to to stand the test of time. Yes, it was a massive risk, certainly in the United States. Um, but sure enough, um, here we are. I think every other program has, has, has got there. 
Um, before we kind of move on from that, I do want to touch on um, a thought because it, this this occurred when I was when I was at S, at SPG. Mm -hmm. um, I had kind of come out of bringing Sheraton Club International in house, and Starwood, uh, a real estate investment trust, had just bought Weston as a small hotel company at the time. I think there was about 40, 30, 40 hotels. And then they subsequently bought um, Sheraton, uh, uh, ITT and the brands of ITT, which included Sheraton, Four Points, St. Regis, um, the Chigo Hotels, which kind of started the luxury collection. But when we started building SPG, we kind of, that was a moment in time where we were thinking about, we don't want to build just another hotel loyalty program we want to build a program that is the best in the world and at the time we were thinking about the fact that airlines had kind of led the way in um shaping loyalty programs within travel and this was our opportunity to reshape or reinvent loyalty within hospitality and that was the kind of that was the the conception of of spg and then I feel like, or I felt like, now I spent 11 years at, at Starwood, but I felt like airlines had gone stale in that time and Velocity didn't even exist. Uh, and Virgin Australia didn't even exist at that time. But, but airlines had become complacent with their loyalty programs and had kind of lost their way. And it took a reimagination like yours um, and in, in the mine at JetBlue to kind of almost reinvent it again. And, mm -hmm. and breathe some life into it. Um, are we at a point in time where um, these programs are ripe to be reinvented again, do you think? Well, definitely, right, definitely. Um, so the only thing I don't know is, well, what I've got wrong in the past is timeline. So I mentioned before in 2008, I'm screaming everyone, you're gonna change. It just took a lot, long, lot, lot longer. Right now, I can see some really big imbalances in the industry, um, ironically, because some of the things they've copied, they've copied without understanding. And so I'll give you, uh, well, I'll give you, um, I'll give you an example, right? Is um, there was a small period of time, right? So I said we, we launched with, with uh, the world's best airline rewards, right? There's a small yeah. period of time when we launched with just dynamic rewards. So we have revenue accrual and dynamic rewards, and we thought it was great. And the customer did not get it. And the partners could not see the value, right? So we, we ran it for, for probably, it might have been six months at the end, um, but we ran it for a while. Um, we did lots of promotions and the customers were not getting it and the partners were, were, were we're, we're not, we're, we're, the, the negotiations with partners are very, very difficult because the points you could work out the, the, the value. And um, we had to then reinvent the rewards by putting in the, the second, the other tier, we have classic rewards, any seat rewards, any seat on any airline in the world, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that model was solved everything. Now, what I'm seeing now is a lot of airlines are basically doing what we did when they, they're, they're moving to the dynamic rewards um, without understanding some of the pros that classic rewards bring, and you got, I, I fear that right now that there's the, the, the for the last twenty years, the airlines have been over successful in their in their relationship with the banks. That yeah. that that the airlines have had a lot of power, and ordinarily, if you were going to write a hard paper on this stuff, ordinarily there would have been a bit more balance. But the airlines have had it their own way for a long time. I do fear that by um, the, 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 the moves over the last few years have left the, the, the airlines exposed and the banks could either uh, take them out or the, the power balance is going to shift significantly and um, the airlines need to reinvent themselves to, to, uh, to either maintain the power or to make sure that they continue to, to offer something that they the financial service companies cannot. So I do worry that if they, if they don't reinvent themselves soon, that the, 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 a lot of the advantages that have built up over 20 years, which to your point, they've got really, really comfortable, they're complacent. Um, a lot of, there's, uh, there's a problem in a lot of frequent flyer programs is that the people in them don't understand how important they are to the airline. Right. They, 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 they're only looking at the bottom line. Um, 
and the bottom line are, are healthy you know that um but yeah I, I, I almost feel like on, on that point, people that are running those programs now are people that have inherited the program. Yeah. And exactly. they, they haven't really kind of started a program from scratch. So therefore, they're, they're kind of narrowed in their creative thinking in the sense that they're looking at what's there and it has, uh, what has worked versus kind of thinking about it from a blank sheet of paper perspective. Now, that's just my own perspective um but i would encourage leaders of, of, of loyalty programs today to start thinking about that in the sense that set your team up in such a way that they can run what's there today and take a select few of people and start thinking about if i was going to start this from scratch how would i do it yeah exactly that well how would i do it from scratch and how would i do it uh, how would I do it for an airline? So if you're an airline right. guy or if you're a hotel guy, if, or, or if even if you're a retail guy, but how would you do it for that core business? Because I do, I, I'm, I'm hearing more and more and more that people who run programs now start think they're like a credit card company. Yeah. And I've, I've gone and lifted the bonnet on a few of these programs where they've, they've got overreached to become essentially credit card companies and they, they lose um their power to engage which is often through the airline yeah um what aspects of lloyd's programs do you see being accelerated and what do you see kind of falling by the wayside um because of of the, well not just because of the crisis but it maybe the crisis is a a good time to start thinking about reimagining I, I, I do actually worry about the crisis. Down, down in Australia, it's probably a bit more acute because there's only two major airlines and one of them's in administration, being Virgin. Um, and like I say, the, if it wasn't for the trust, right now people would be losing their points. Uh, so even, even with the trust, there's still um, a, a fair amount of concern out there about the sustainability of reward programs and, and people are starting to question uh, whether it's sensible to to have all your points with anyone let alone an airline yeah. right so I think yeah. right now that, that, that there's two there's two sort of things going on one is is that um, people are starting to think is that is it better to have my points there or should I keep them somewhere else but the other thing is I'm expecting is is a, a much more uh, rise in non stored value rewards, obviously cash back or other types of rewards. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of companies out there right now will be are looking at how do we take advantage of this and giving giving um, customers instant value back as opposed to stored value is going to be popular for the next little while. Mm -hmm. which, which, which is, it's, it's going to be bad news for the airlines because they're going to need the um, revenue from these programs. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's that's that is the the it's it's almost like a, a quandary in in some ways because while while there is an opportunity for people to get to work and start thinking about what are the things I wish I could always have done with my program right now when nobody's kind of traveling is probably an opportunity in some ways to kind of start reimagining for the future but in other ways you're stuck with getting yourself ready for the, for the, for the future um i just want to um uh for a moment just just acknowledge our sponsors um here uh engage amia uh adara and hilton honors who are the official um hotel program for um the loyalty summit in the americas and also Radisson Rewards for the official hotel program uh, uh, for um, for the Loyalty Summit in London, which will be coming later this year. All things, all things uh, being considered, that that, that, that they'll uh, they'll return to, to normal. Um, talk a little bit of, um, about New World Loyalty and what you've seen because. You've come out of the airline industry and now you've kind of looked at many other industries and in many ways you've had to kind of reinvent loyalty um, across industries um, in some cases you've probably shut 
programs down as well to to reimagine them is that fair no that's exactly right um first i'll, I'll be honest with you um uh, i was totally unprepared when i left virgin for how hard it is to make loyalty work in other industries so there's a lot of advantages advantages in travel which you just take for granted um uh, we, like i say we've we've worked across lots of different things um keep key, some of the, the reinventions have been fairly small um i'll give you an example I, I, there was a, a major pharmacy down here in australia called priceline um they had a very very uh complicated pro well it wasn't very pro it was it was a program which had all the normal bells and whistles but it was it was a bit complicated um and customers didn't get it and staff didn't get it um and i did a project when we looked, lifted the bonnet and there was basically two options there was a whole range of some exciting fantastic things they could have done or they could have just done some really simple things there was a two-stage earn rate they could have changed they could change that um change the point of sale process and relaunch it yep. and they went for the second option because it was a lot cheaper and quicker and it was phenomenally successful phenomenally right. Literally, just by taking out a two-stage, taking out an awkwardness, um, making it easier to to promote to staff first, and then to, to customers, all the all the reasons the program wasn't working were removed, and it just went berserk. It's funny. I'm I'm, I'm having conversations myself um, with with uh, some people here in the United States, and um, they, you know. They, they've conceived ideas and they're all great ideas. And when, then when you start to think about, so how do I actually articulate this um, value proposition to, to the target customer? And you start to realize that there lies in there, there's a problem. If you can't do that simply, then you lose. Um, so we've kind of started to strip it all back. And then it's, it's really about kind of, making sure the message is easy to articulate making sure the member kind of understands it if there are layers you want to build onto that later then that's fine but it's it's about kind of taking a a step-by-step -step approach to it um, uh, just touching on 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 the crisis i do want to i i do want to kind of make a, a public service announcement if that's okay i want to take a moment to acknowledge that you know Right now, times are tough for for folks uh, and and colleagues of ours and friends of ours on this webcast today. We're seeing a lot of layoffs around the world in the travel industry, and many of our industry colleagues and friends, and of course everyone on this call is affected uh, by the current global events in in some manner. Um, I do have a slide that. Um, I'd like to 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 show if um, maybe that's not the one. Um, if I cancel that one, um, let me see where it is. Is it this one? There's a panic button on here, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the slides. Um, I think it's here actually. Um, if 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 Michael can can possibly help me with uh, WhatsApp, that would be good. But anyway, I just wanted to talk about our good friends at Travel Data Daily are putting together a loyalty report, which will feature industry suppliers and vendors and brands that are stepping up to assist the airlines and hotel loyalty programs in uh, you know in in the challenging times that we're going through. If you are, if any of your colleagues or friends. Um, here we go. Here's the slide. I, I think if, if you know, if, if you represent an industry supplier or vendor, um, please reach out um, and um, you know contact Mark um, and let us know that that your organisation can participate. There are no costs, and your company may be featured in the report, which will be shared across the loyalty industry. Um, one additional thing is the loyalty summit is proud to be part uh, to be a participating organization in the report and the loyalty summit will be providing complimentary tickets to all airline and hotel employees for the new york and london loyalty summit events so make sure you get in touch with mark the submission deadline is may the 7th which i believe is two days from now um the email address is on the slide, but I don't think the slide has come up. 
Um, so what we'll do is we will publish this slide on uh, the LinkedIn uh, site for, for um, the Loyalty Summit, and you'll be able to get details there. Or if you have uh, Mark Ross Smith's email or contact information, uh, please go ahead and, and reach out to him directly. Or if, if, if you uh, have the contact information for Phil or myself, uh, feel free to do that also. Um, we stop the, the spinning wheel, I think, if that's all right, and um, try and get back to, uh, is it you and me? Um, is our camera on? I'm not entirely sure what's after happening, but we'll continue with the chat. Phil, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about what is happening in in um, in the current environment and whether there's an opportunity for um, somebody to to think about reinventing. What would they? What what are the first things they need to to do? Do you think? So, oh, no, no different from what I said right at the beginning. They need to go back to what what are their who are their core customers. What and what do they see, think, and do? Uh, what what do they need to achieve? What's different? And that last that the business objectives is a bit is probably most changing at the moment. Is what do they need the program to do? Um, and then what's the numbers behind it? What's the economics? Uh, no different. Every situation is the same um, because of the current situation. Um, there's there there are constraints. There be, there's going to be certain constraints and certain. Um, uh, obligations placed on the programs but I do think that, like I say to try and get in the in the eyes of a customer think what they're thinking through make to me that what the, what the what the travel companies need to do right now is twofold is is, is they've got a leverage if to me if I was running the program right now and as soon as we had the new schedules up uh, I would be leveraging the store of value to get people reward seats in cabins they could ne not not normally um, only aspire to um, to get people on planes um, and also give them a loyalty reward which they'll be talking about for a long long time and to use that one um, use that one of that first flight to get them flying again that that's what I would be doing I, I would be giving them lots and lots and lots of um, of availability at the front um, that isn't because it's it's I'm, I'm, I'm a I'm, a, I'm I believe in they have to pay for it. But I believe in that the, the, the seats are going to be free, um, available, and you, using the Lordy program as a tool to get people flying again would be really sensible. Um, and and basically that would be my my big big focus. So, so it's it's a bit boring. It's not really reinventing the world, but will. But it's it's basically making sure you don't um, lose sight of the basics. Yeah. Um... You know, and, and it's kind of funny um, when when people do lose sight of the basics, it actually gets quite kind of dangerous, I'll be honest with you, um, because I have seen people take on programs uh, not understanding the basics, and in so, in all of a sudden you've got a program that's kind of upside down. Yeah, no, exactly. The, the, the thing I see more than anything is people just blindly copy. Um, frequently, people people call New World Loyalty in and they say, we want a velocity or, or we want uh, and they point to another program out there, and they say, well, "That's what we we like that." And um, well, two things: a) they don't actually know if that program's working for the for the host; um, b) they certainly don't know if it's going to work for them. Um, so, you, so you've got to be you've got to be really, really careful about copying. And, and you you mentioned Flyer Talk before. Um, one of the, one of my learnings early on is is there a valuable lens, but usually, generally, completely uneconomic. Um, most of the suggestions put out on Flyer Talk would send airlines bust um, even quicker than they are. Yeah. So uh, speaking of, of Flyer Talk, is is that? Um, I mean, Flyer Talk has been around as long as you and I have. Yeah. Um, in fact, I've still, I, I, I haven't had hair like this in status quo. We're on their last end of the world tour. Um, so I, I've got COVID nineteen possibly to thank for that, but. Flyer Talk um, as a forum um, does it does it add value? Is it is it creating value, or is it um, is it some is it one of those things that has kind of got tired over time? 
Okay. I, I would I would still say yes, but and what I mean by that is um I I, I use and and Flyer Talks the one in the states, but over here we got one called AF Australian Frequent Flyer. Um, I use them to. Um, a bit like you did, I would use them to um, review, stress test, um, offer their opinions and stuff. And I would, I would, I would always be interested in what they would think. Um, mm -hmm. But I would always, I never for, lost sight of the fact they were the point one percenters. They were the few, the, the the people that had the time and the interest to really pull things apart. And that isn't what most customers do. Um, to your point before, keep it simple. It's really necessary for most people. These guys spend the time and get into the detail. Um, and I would I would make sure that I would not um, over compensate for them. As in, the, the program was always designed, every program I've, I've worked on, designed for the masses. I understand the outliers, but designed for the masses um, and don't um, don't risk the value to, to, to most people for the sake of avoiding um, risk with the, with the people at the edges. Yeah. Um, do you have any examples, Phil, or, uh, that you've come across where um, somebody has tried something and pivoted quickly um, and then realized success? I think you actually mentioned it a little bit yourself at, at the top with, with Velocity. But how important is it to be being able to pivot very quickly, to being able to realize that, okay, this is actually going in a different direction? Oh, so important. So one of the things I say to all, my, all the clients is, is never be afraid to change. Um, if, if one of the things I've seen again frequently is people get, get tied up with this fear of making a change to a program. And, and I've done it many times. Um, I, I, I tend to um, advocate to take the plaster off quickly um, option. Um, uh, early, well, not just early days, throughout velocity, throughout, throughout the seven years, we bashed loads of stuff out there. Most mm -hmm. of it was pretty good. Most of it was, was really good. Every now and again, we've just got some things wrong. Um, and so we, we changed things. We, I remember the, the, the second relaunch, we did two major relaunches. Second one, we offered um, a lounge pass with every 100 status credits, um, which we thought was brilliant because it, was, it meant there was always a, a target. Um, but the, the relaunch, the original relaunch itself was just way too successful. Um, and the number of platinums um, increased by a factor of four within the first few months. Um, so, so we were already bursting out of, out of the seams um, in the lounges, and we just had to, even though it was, it was a, a popular pro um, benefit, we had to just take it away. Um, yeah. And you got you got a little bit of noise. You, some of it you get you get a, a burst of noise, especially through social media. Um, for days, and then it goes. Um, yeah. So I would, I, I, I've seen, and I've advocated on many a times. Be, be, be willing to make changes. Um, be willing to take away value as well as give value. Um, don't always try and hide it. I, I, I always believe in you lead with your chest. If you're doing something ugly, tell people. Yeah. Um, one of the other, one one of the things I would also suggest, um, because I and I, I think you and I are probably good examples of this, um, is don't be afraid to reach out to your peer at a competitor. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're we're all in this together. Uh, we may be running different programs, but we should be learning from each other. Um, and I think there, you know, I've always felt that there's been a natural respect um, within the within the space uh, of the leaders of loyalty. And, you know, there, there are things that we always learn from each other. And to your point about copying, in some ways, um, we've all kind of got to the same place in some way by copying an idea that we've seen before. Um, but it's important that you actually understand the reasoning behind some of the ideas that, that, that come to the fore. Yeah, you should, I believe you should always be able to construct something from first principles. So even yes. if the idea comes from another program, you need to others construct it up from this is how it will work for us and this is how the maths will work. Um, I, I'm, I, I truly believe that 
uh, maths is our friend. And that's one of the other things I, 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 I'm an advocate for is that the, one of the beauties of, of loyalty is that there's so much that's measurable. Um, and if you get hold, if, you've got to understand the maths. And if you design it well, and it, sound, it might sound boring, but if you design it well so that everything contributes something, then it's just a pure volume game. And, and, and you, all of a sudden, you're not, you're not trying to re restrict and con con contain. You're just trying to grow, which is easy. Yeah, yeah. Um, to, to those who are enjoying the, the webcast and are looking forward to, to next week's uh, webcast, um, please register. Um, you, you've still got to register for, for those. Um, so on May 12th, it's all about managing loyalty across industries. Um, and the, um, the, the guests on that will be Ian Pringle, Adam Poster, and Rob McLean. So a great lineup of, of people to listen to. These are people that have been stalwarts in the, in the industry and uh, a lot to learn from them. So make sure you, you register for uh, next week's um, uh, Lloyd Summit coming up. And um, also anybody who's looking to, to contact uh, Mark Ross Smith, it's mark at traveldatadaily.com. So mark at traveldatadaily.com. Um, if you or your friends or uh, vendors or industry suppliers would like to, to participate and um, help our colleagues in, in, in the, the, the travel space. Um, Phil, if, if you were starting a program from scratch tomorrow yep. in the travel space, how would you begin? Oh, uh, the same as I've mentioned before, I, I, first thing I would do is I go to the business and understand what is the business what who what's their target market what are they trying to achieve where are they, where are they successful and then i'd go to the customer and ask them a stack of questions about about what they think feel um a lot of one of the things i'm passionate about is is the feeling as opposed to the thinking uh what what, what do they feel would be fair what would they what do they feel would be a, an appropriate um reward relationship with their with the travel but partner um and only after that do you, you you get into the into the design get into the maths and get into the into the into the program itself yeah so you, you used an interesting word there uh what would be fair um and you know i um certainly as i travel and uh, not right now of course but as as i travel and as i interact with other brands and so forth Certainly in the retail space, I have found those programs to become more and more simplified. And if, um, when, I, when I talk about retail, specifically in uh, quick service restaurants, yep. um, I'm starting to see those programs really resonate with the younger audience. Are there things that the travel industry can learn are there things that um, if if we can if we can bring something into our travel programs, are there things from from those types of industries that we can can take? I think ideas can come from anywhere. Right. So I, I do think it's sensible for for uh, all of us to be constantly looking at, at other industries and, and seeing looking for the idea, but. But leaving it at that, so taking the idea, and I'll, I'll give you an example: is um, quick service restaurants you're talking about there. Yeah, is, um, is I, I did a project with with one, and the the program they had looked brilliant. Um, it was very very rewarding for um, the people who basically came in every single Friday and and have and I bought the, the same um, meal every week without fail, and it was a brilliant program for them. Um, and the, the business thought it was great because they were, in their eyes, locking in those um, customers. And the program was pretty much irrelevant to everyone else. Right? Um, and when we, when we lifted the bonnet on, well, when I analyzed it, um, most of those customers were buying anyway. They weren't buying because of the program. They were buying because every Friday that's what they did. Um, they were giving away huge value for no benefit. And the people they needed to encourage, which are the people that were irregular customers, it was irrelevant to. So we redesigned it to be uh, slightly less generous to the 
the Friday people, we, we redesigned the rewards. So instead of just giving them a free meal every six weeks, we, we gave them uh, enhanced rewards if they took extra sides instead of just the core meal. Um, mm. And then separately, we were much more generous to the people who were infrequent travelers, um, buyers. Um, and again, the maths really took off. But by loyalty is a dumb word for the industry because um, it, it breeds bad design. But that, 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 that program was almost like a, the inverse of loyalty. It was trying to be more rewarding to people that were infrequent diners. Um, well, well that, that though in, in and of itself kind of taking it back to, to travel in some ways um, it is quite similar like JetBlue certainly when I started True Blue mm -hmm. that program was built around infrequent flyers yep. um, and you know that's where the longevity of it is is you know these people are con continuously rewarded for other types of behaviors as well because we, we we started looking at bringing other um dimensions to it over over time um was was velocity a, a frequent flyer program or was it an infrequent flyer program ah oh, so uh uh, there were several sort of customer groups we looked at, and we want we needed to be relevant to them all. So there was a there was a core group of people that, that were flying with the airline, and and we needed to um, we needed to meet their expectations. I think that was the fairness thing. They weren't going to fly a lot more because they were quite um, quite quite loyal for what a better word. Anyway, they were buying on price, and Virgin was the cheapest. Um, but there, we didn't want to upset them. We we wanted to keep them by not upsetting them. Um, but the but the upside was 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 from the long tail. The upside was from getting people that were um, not flying with Virgin much. We were just doing it infrequently to trade up a little bit and to enable the the airline to attract people that were only flying with their competitor because of some of the benefits that they had. So there was like three different groups, and we and we we had different. Um, activities for the three different groups one program but three that very very different strategies yeah and I you know it's, it's kind of funny because I, I do think that the um, the emergence of loyalty programs in every industry that you go into now there's some form of loyalty program whether it be B2C or B2B um, yeah. these have have become almost um, second nature to everybody it's almost an expectation that um you go into a store of any type you even go into a pharmacy there is some level of of a, a program there to try and and uh, get you to enroll i would assume that in many cases those were born out of reflecting on what happened in the travel industry and seeing how people kind of created a stickiness over time um and it's almost kind of like they're harvesting some of the better ideas and then thinking about okay i want to simplify it i want to simplify it and i want to make sure that i'm giving these instant type of of rewards very 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 um low value but at the same time meaningful value because they're instantaneous um that's not that's not where we've gone in the travel space no but it, i i do, i do think in the travel space there's certain like say the customer is a bit of a certain expectation um and you've got to be i i, I one of the things i always say is, is is the worst thing you do is is not meet an expectation and so there so there is a we've got to be careful you don't take away some of the things that the customer just think it's believe is fair and reasonable um uh, the retail i've yeah. got a lot of different retail programs and i'll be honest with you often uh, the advice i give is actually to take them out um and it d doesn't mean there's not a program in place but the what they what, what they often need is is um customer identification and communications and, and promotional program as opposed to a traditional loyalty program yeah and because to, to your point because customers are so interested um used to just like, giving them given their mobile number or given their um email or id or name at the, at the point of sale then often you can do away with, uh, with some of the complexities of a program just do some simple promotions right and i you know i i, th I think the the fact that people um 
are part of these. I, I do feel like those types of organizations are leveraging the data better um, in the sense that they're serving up offers that are much more relevant and possibly happening in flow uh, as well at the same time. Um, and I do think that there's an opportunity for us in travel to start thinking about how, if we know somebody is traveling, can we serve them up a tailored offer for that particular moment in time? And it may be just the gesture of a drinks coupon or whatever for that flight. Um, you know, something simple, or it may be, a, a, you know, a digital coupon that allows them to get, you know, um, through security faster or into a lounge. Simple things, some kind of surprise and delight elements, I suppose, um, are, are things that we should be thinking about. Um, I think, you know, you're right, especially with the mobile technology nowadays, it's, it's easy to do. Some of the things that weren't possible a few years ago, you can actually do now quite easily. Yeah, it kind of gets back to the, you know, what I was saying uh, around if you wanted to reimagine your program, now might be the right time because you can think about what are all the things I've wanted to be able to do that I haven't been able to do. Yeah. Um, maybe there's an opportunity. Certainly, as you start thinking about reinventing a program, think about what are the things that you've wanted to be able to do, but you just haven't been able to make them happen. Think about why that is. Um, and also, if you leave things go too long, they actually do become almost irrelevant or they may that 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 may have passed um, so make sure that the, the the thinking is current and I've often thought and you know you, you know yourself that I'm very very interested in the the generation Z um, uh, population that are starting to come into travel uh, now and in many cases the programs that are out there have been built They've been built, uh, most of them are over 10 years old, let's say. Um, and that's a long time in loyalty. Um, and it's those, way too long. Yeah, and, I, the, and, I, the, I, people, yeah, and the, people, the people that kind of created those programs, created them to be relevant in that time. Um, so there is an opportunity now to start thinking about what is it that these new uh, Generation Z populations are looking for? Because they are different. Yeah. No, you're exactly right. And, and they have far less patience than uh, the older generations. So how can you, how can you meet that need, which is it's going to be a challenge. But yeah, I, you know, go, go, on, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I've, always, I've always referred to a loyalty program as a shark. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to keep swimming. If you, if you stop, and you get fat and lazy and, and someone's going to like customers will get will get tired of it. But um, partners will get tired of it as well. You've, you should you should always, I think, be looking for what else can you do? What new what new things can you do? What what rubbish things can you take away? And keep keep yeah. it going. Yeah. Um, great conversation, Phil. Um, any uh, if, if we were to end, what, what would be the top three things? So let's let's start with your best experience in loyalty, um, your, your, your favorite memory, um, and which programs, what are the programs that you admire most? Ooh, so my, I do, funny enough, I do think one of my favorite members is, is the, the conference in Istanbul when, when little old Virgin Blue was telling the world they're all wrong and, and eventually, eventually getting proved right. Um, but most of my, most of my um, upside from loyalty has, has come from customer feedback. Uh, there's, there, there, um, Virgin put in a lot of family benefits. I, I had a young family at the time, and, I, and a lot of the family benefits we did were designed around a, a young family. And part of that was obviously my lens, but part of it was because um, a lot of the customers, the core customers, were businessmen with, of that age group. And I had, pe I had people coming up to me in tears with, um, telling me how, how those benefits had, had enabled them to do things that they couldn't otherwise done. Uh, literally emotion, getting really emotional once they found out who I was and um, mm -hmm. thanking me for those things. And that, that really, really does give you um, goosebumps. Brilliant. Um, and what, sorry, what was the last question? Uh, the, the programs you most admire. Oh, sad to say, but I do, I, I do admire Qantas. Um, 
it's a cracking program. Not 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 so much for the core program. I think Virgins was a better core program, but for what they've done around the outside, how they keep building um, businesses around the outside, uh, all of them um, works for for them themselves, but also for the customer and for the partner. They've got this really good partner airline customer model. Terrific. I you know it's it's funny. I I think my own memories um, certainly started out uh, uh, SPG and and some of the the learnings there um, were terrific um, I, I I also think the adversity that you kind of go through in trying to realize a vision um, there is there is absolute um, it's it's hard work but at the same time there there's a lot of satisfaction when when you get through the other side and you start seeing the fruits of your labor, and then it gets validated by the industry actually changing um, and adjusting to, to some of the ideas that you've brought to the table. Um, and the human element, I think you're, you're so right to touch on that. Um, uh, I too have experienced that where, where I've had people come up to me and talk to me about some of the things that we've, we've done. Um, I've, I've had people complain as well, but the things that kind of linger with you are the ones where people point out the most meaningful impact you've had on them and their, their families uh, and what we've enabled. Um, you know what? I think we, we, we have worked and we've been lucky enough to work in an amazing industry. It's an industry that's hurting right now, but um, it's, it's by no means kind of dead. It's the, the world is waiting to kind of uh, get back out there and explore. Um, and I, I, th I think um, the, the, the programs are there to help as well. Yeah, I think they're gonna be a big part of the, of the relaunching, I think. Yeah, so with that, Phil, uh, uh, we call it a day. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I know it's late there. Um, and to those of you who have been, um, uh, watching around the world. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to listen to us old fogies here, chat about some of the things that we've done, uh, some of the things we're thinking about. Uh, we wish you well. And again, um, feel free to, to reach out to, to Mark at uh, the traveldatadaily.com uh, um, and let's see if we can help uh, the travel industry get back uh, to where it needs to be. Okay, with that, uh, I'm going to say cheerio, and um, thanks for staying with us. Great. Thanks, David. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.